All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. It's our big Friday show. You are so lucky to be here. Wow, there's so much going on. And then there's all our regular Friday stuff going on. Kim is here today. Kim, how are you? Yeah. Uh, The thing about Kim, she had a big day yesterday. If you missed it, she booted a couple of people out of the chat, which is, I'm, you know, I'm not a big one for booting people. But then again, I'm not reading the chat and figuring out this person is just, you know, throwing smoke bombs and this kind of thing. So I leave it to Kim and Kim is a she's tough. She's tough. So she threw out two people. Good day, sir. Yeah, it was it was rough yesterday in the chat. So I don't know what today's chat's going to bring, but uh, Kim. See, I'm already on it. I'm keep up. your finger on the button, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a special birthday that just came in right before we started. And a donation was attached to that, so I'll get to that. Avila and Shore in the second hour along with Michael Snyder. So much to do. I'm excited. I've got a pot of that. Coachella Valley coffee in me. Yeah. My head's about to explode. So Courtney got up today and she said, is uh, the holiday blend, did you make? I said, the coffee's ready. She said, did you make the holiday blend? Uh, no, it just came in the holiday blend, you know, yesterday. So I haven't, I'm still grinding the stuff that was in there. This is the last day we'll grind. We'll have the holiday blend to start tomorrow. And she was kind of disappointed by that. Uh, yeah, but the holiday blend is... Um, uh, is a Coachella Valley coffee. They are our holiday, holiday partners. There it is. And um, we will have it over the weekend. Bright yeah. citrus and juicy stone fruit notes. They have tasting notes. Can you see at the bottom of CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. And if you go and you're new, please do use our discount code, Mark T. I mean, if you mm-hmm. aren't new, you, you still use the code. But I'm saying you may not be aware of the code if you're new. So Mark T at checkout for 10% off. And they're great partners with the show. So we'll talk to uh, them at some point, maybe during the holidays. But the holiday blend, perfect for the... Have you tasted it? Is it good? Uh, I haven't tasted it yet. I literally okay. have to open that package. So on okay. Monday, I will report, though. Oh, I guess Monday, you're here doing the show by yourself, right? Yeah. And not even a producer. It's just me. This I'm going to be like the one-man band. So no ex- big expectations, anybody. We're just going to lower that bar all the way down to Albertville. <laughs> <laughs> Albert, thank you. So, Albert, thank you for the bar lowering yes. now becoming socially acceptable. But I will tell you, that, uh, so here's what's happening, just to get you up to speed. And then I want to tell you a quick story, which I meant to tell you a couple of days ago. It just happened to me. And uh, now I see something on the screen. I must put my credibility glasses on. Jim Slayton, 499, says, yes, I'm very unhappy with everything I've heard today on your show. <laughs> just kidding. Where is that I'm um, very unhappy? Uh, I think it's in a sting. We use it uh, here in the sting. Yes, I'm very unhappy with everything I've yeah, heard today on your yeah. show. Yeah. Use it that way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, We don't run that much, but uh, she was great. We used to run it at the top of every hour, the second hour of the show, at the top of every second hour on the radio. Um, the other birthday thing, and then I would say this quick to the story, and then I've got a lot of stuff to get to, but uh, it came in early pre uh show you know the chat is live how about it for hand picked books yt check oh. it out overdue thanks for your great show that keeps me entertained whilst i pound the old computer as you know if you're a regular viewer listener whilst is a ding word yeah. Lucky double-digit numbers in honor of my 1111 birthday tomorrow. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. And thank you, Yay. Handpicked Books YT. Big shout out. Big shout out. Very cool. What a nice contribution. Happy, happy birthday to you. Really great. Cool. Um, and, uh, you know, we're a crowdfunded show in the main, mm-hmm. so you, without you guys, we don't 
have anybody. And in that spirit, I wanted to welcome into our community. I always get an advisory when we get somebody new in the community, Kim. Mm -hmm. Community of supporters. And uh, couldn't do it without him. Um, Tom Malloy with a big shout out. How about it for Tom, who's a new Patreon member? Isn't that cool? Every month tosses us something. Charlie Jarrett, come on. Big shout out. Big shout out to Charlie Jarrett, a new Patreon member. Welcome, Tom and Charlie. Yeah. Linda and Rob, if I haven't yet. Big shout out. Big shout out. Thank you for uh-huh. our being Thank new you. Patreon members. Uh, really does matter. And uh, Karen edited her existing Patreon membership from $10, I believe, to $20 a Big month. Big shout oh, out. Come on. I love that, too. So that really yeah. does, um, it does matter. And might I say to all of you, Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, Mm -hmm. so much. Just sounds better in a fake British accent, doesn't it? Indeed. So, uh, all right, a lot to do today, and then I'll get you up to speed on some of the stuff that's happening here on the show. The Mark Thompson Show. In fact, I'll start with that. Uh, Today, um, there will be no Albert. Um, I know that that's odd. What? And no Tony. What? Yeah, so it's just Kim and myself today. Um, Tony's a KFI, nice, Tony. and, and, and uh, Albert's going back to the Philippines. Mm-hmm. So, uh, very exciting. Albert did curate a Friday Fabulous Florida for us before he left. I saw some gators in there. Yeah. And I have to say, shout out to Albert because his normal, you know, he's very proud. He has pride of ownership. And see yeah. if you don't agree with me on this. One of the things we've lost in this country is pride of ownership about work. <laughs> uh, I just find it nowhere. It's like if I had any job, and I have had any job, yeah. I have pride of ownership. I'll do the best job I can with whatever the crappy sure. assignment that I have is, you know? And yeah. I think we. If it's we, a ditch you're digging, it's the best ditch ever, right? We've kind of lost that a little bit. You know, we yeah. kind of blame other people for the job not being right. I could have done a better job if it weren't for so and so. Or whatever, I didn't want this job anyway, I'm above this, whatever, you know, it's, you didn't train me properly how to do that, whatever people say, I've just found a lack of pride of ownership. So Albert has pride of ownership over Florida. He will curate it despite the fact that he's not here. Mm -hmm. So uh, bravo Albert, and he's left us a good one. Then Michael Shore and Jim Avila will decode a lot of the politics of america right now I love and there's some two. weird aspects to that in the second hour what's that yeah. kim i love those two yeah they are great and then the culture blaster michael snyder uh the second half of the second yeah. hour love so uh, good that's what's happening on the show um and again monday still no albert and no tony and no mark Kim will have to do the show by this herself is just on getting Monday. Out of hand. I this is where I protest. Yeah. No, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do whatever needs to be done. We have a question from Jabbermocky. Oh. It says, "Pardon my unintended ignorance, but from whence does the Mark Thompson show originate? I'm a Rhode Islander. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Do I detect a Detroit accent or not? I don't hear a Detroit from Mark. There's no Midwest going on there. No, there's no, no. Detroit. Um but before I answer, and I do intend to answer fully, Jabbermocky, I do want to recognize whence as a ding word. Mm. So when you say from whence, um, I'm not even sure I know what whence means. It's that big <laughs> a ding word. Let me just, do you know what whence means? Where. Uh, it means where? Mm-hmm. Huh, that's really cool. From where, what place? Mm. Mm-hmm. From whence. As a certain... Quality. I don't really know you, Jabba Maki, but there's a certain refinement to the way you've constructed your question. It's the sort of refinement that I believe warrants special recognition. And Uh-oh. so when you say you're new, I want you to, and we've never done this with a new listener of yours. Uh oh. I want you to receive. Receive it now. 
and receive it for a lifetime. Receive the rod of equity and mercy. I know there are going to be those of you who say, how can you? Please don't interrupt my trance. Uh, <laughs> Jabberwocky, you receive. Receive the rod of equity and mercy. Receive the rod of equity and mercy. And I know, Jabberwocky, you are new, so I will tell you that the rod of equity and mercy and the bestowment of same lasts a lifetime. Receive the rod of equity and mercy. No, oh no boosters required. The answer is, um, I'm from Washington, D.C. Kim is from Northern California. Mm -hmm. And uh, th those are the accents, I think, that are represented here. Yeah. I'm sort of accentless, I think, but maybe you can. No, I, I don't pick up anything. Can you, can you say yesterday I played golf? Um, I played golf. Is that a yeah? Because you... see, the in Detroit they say golf, golf. Oh, you know, so I, there's I no there's Detroit any, going. There's on. There's no Detroit no. here. No, definitely yeah. not. Yeah. But uh, but nonetheless, uh, good yeah. guess and a good post, and you got the rod of equity and mercy. So bravo on that. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, quickly, I want to recognize, thank you, Kelly Malloy, by the way. Kelly, just yeah. with a quick uh, $5 or $4, $5. Big shout Big out. Big shout out. Thank you. Uh, super sticker, super chat. Those are live throughout the show. If you want to jump on a super sticker or super chat, that's so great. If it's a super chat, we'll try to get that chat on right away when you send it um, with whatever you have to contribute. And there could be a lot. Frank Borman passed away. He was the first... The first Apollo mission, the Apollo 8 mission that went to the moon, they didn't land on the moon. They had to sort of road test the technology mm -hmm. so that they could orbit the moon first. And then the plan ultimately became while one dude orbited, and they were all dudes back then doing it, they would send a craft down to the moon's surface and... The other guy would, you know, and then it's all arithmetic, right? You have to make sure that the the docking and the return home is done uh, cleanly. So to essentially work that out, they had this Apollo 8 mission, and the astronauts were the first men to orbit the moon. And that famous image of the Earth rising over the, the moon, it's a very famous picture that was taken by one of the members on board Apollo 8. Um, he was 95 years old, Frank Borman. He never set foot on the moon, and he had no desire to do so, he said. He flew in space twice. He commanded the uh, two-man Gemini 7 spacecraft. That was a 14-day flight. That was then a record for time and space. Now you have people up in the space station, they're there for a year. And again, all of these things were to develop maneuvers outside the spacecraft uh, to figure out with the existing technology what they could actually do. He was trained as a fighter pilot, pilot known for his lightning quick reflexes, exceptional decision-making skills. One of the best pure pilots that NASA had, said another astronaut, uh, James Lovell, who flew with him on both Gemini 7 and Apollo 8. So um, he went on to be, I believe, the CEO of Eastern Airlines. Wasn't it an airline company? Mm. Yeah. Uh, but certainly he'll be known for the Apollo 8 mission and for uh, his... Con yeah, he became the chairman of Eastern Airlines in 1976 when the company was close to bankruptcy. He persuaded the airline's unions to accept a wage freeze... There is the iconic picture. Thank you, Kim. That is the picture taken from Apollo 8. And you know, this, for those listening, is the Earth rising over the lunar surface. And it's, it's significant for so many reasons. But you just see the perfection of the Earth in the emptiness of space. Not to be too heavy, but it's just a delicate environment. And the delicate nature of this extraordinary balance of ecosystems and habitats, it's to me, it's all implied. It's all stated by implication in that picture. So that's 
Beautiful. Significant indeed. Um, there he is. That's uh, Borman. Anyway, uh, Borman helped Eastern Airlines. And uh, so he was a, a titan in the business community as well. So rest in peace at 95, Frank Borman, who led the first orbit of the moon. The Mark Thompson Show. It's going to wait on this until I've got that story for you. I will tell you it involves my mom's car and uh, and this bizarre thing that happened. Oh, this crap only happens to me, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it in a second. I do. I was going to push this, and I still may push it. Um, I certainly am going to push, and we will get into the. Big news politically, which is associated with uh, Joe Manchin mm. doing what was not unanticipated, but is, I think it's a little bit of a shocker to the system for Democrats, and that is he's leaving the Senate. And as I've told you before, and we will talk about this with Avila and Shure, Horrible as Joe Manchin is, and I think he's horrible, he takes more fossil fuel money than anybody else in Congress. He became something of a massive impediment to Democrats and a lot of the Democratic agenda. And what I really hate about Joe Manchin as well really involves the media, which is they always talk about him as the moderate Democrat. He's not a moderate Democrat. He's really a right-wing Democrat. But the fact that he's a Democrat is a big deal because that D gives you a majority. And with the majority, you have control of committees and you have control of the Senate. Now, without him in a red state, West Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have real challenges now to hold on to the Senate. So we'll talk with Shura and Avila about that. But one of the things I will touch on is the fact that this has been in the works because of GOP planning. Mitch McConnell wanted to bring about this Joe Manchin retirement from the Senate. He wanted that seat. So in between stand-up strokes or whatever is happening with Mitch McConnell, he was planning and planning effectively this elimination of Joe Manchin. Now Manchin may run third party. Manchin's basically a liberal Republican who f filled out the forms wrong, says Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So we'll talk Eric, about that in the next hour. What's that? Eric also says Manchin's seat is 100% going to be replaced by a Republican. Yeah, in West Virginia. I think that yeah. that's a fair yeah. point. Uh, that's kind of what I've been saying for years now. I said it on the radio. Even if we were talking about mansion in different ways because he's been such a high profile impediment to various political agendas on the part of the democrats and you can't do anything about him you need him even as people saying you ought to get rid of him you ought to you know you ought to declare independent i mean you need that d so uh, karen kleiner says oh my god kim do they not put your hosting days on repeat i cannot find no oh, they should all be there yeah, everything's there yeah I don't know if you want to count. really want to go back and, and watch. I mean, Mark Thompson's like a Michael Phelps. You know, he swims through the water. It's like this magic thing happens. Kim, wow. how are you? Wow. I'm in the back of the pool dog paddling my way through. So, I, you know. That's not yeah. true. You have yeah. a lot of appeal and you're yeah. terrific. Ch -ch -ch but I do like <laughs> it when you talk about me as this uh, force Champion. of nature. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Kim. That's really very, very nice. Yeah, was it is Kim? Nice. Is that she was a Karen. Kim also? She's Karen. A Karen. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen Kleiner. But Love she's a that. good kind of Karen. We like her. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. But Kim's thank you. all of Kim's stuff should really be there. Nice. And yeah. if you really want to see Kim unplugged, you'll see her <laughs> unplugged on Monday because that's the Maybe day we she'll do it. Just have the show go dark that day. I don't know. I don't know. Oh uh, no, no, no. You'll be yeah. great. You'll be great. I've said before, and you know, again, we li we live out loud on this show. We tell yeah. you what's going on. I've said before, hey, do you want me to get you a co-host? I mean, I can get somebody to co-host for you. Do you want me to, you know, it's some, it's easier sometimes when you're bouncing mm -hmm. around with someone. She said, nope, nope, nope. I can do it myself. So, uh, so, <laughs> and and she can. So, um, the other thing happening on Capitol Hill that I don't think we will get to with uh, 
sure and Avila, because we'll be talking about the mansion stuff and McConnell and what I think is a um, dereliction of duty on the part of the GOP. You know, the government is going to close down next week, and the head of the House, the guy who can bring forward a budget, Johnson, is going to Paris. We'll talk about that in the next hour. But there was key testimony on Capitol Hill about these airport near misses. Air traffic controller fatigue is a real thing. And we heard in this testimony that took place on Capitol Hill that almost two dozen serious close calls at airports have occurred in the past year. That's the highest number in more than a decade. Scary. So the Senate panel was told this yesterday, and the rise is partly connected to overstretched air traffic controllers. They're regularly required to work up to 60 hours a week. Tammy Duckworth, who's an Illinois Democratic senator, she called the hearing as the chair of the aviation subcommittee, and she said all this stuff is evidence of a system under stress. I don't think there's any arguing that. Our nation is experiencing an aviation safety crisis with near misses that are happening way too frequently, she said. The FAA... Uh, Airlines and unions have been scrambling to try to figure out how to address all of these incidents. I mean, there have been a bunch of close calls. So this hearing yesterday really brought into focus the risks that we're all taking as we fly. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, there's just no way to make up the gap. These are overworked air traffic controllers and... Even though they've called for more hiring, you can't hire people quickly enough and train them quickly enough Mm -mm. to replace this strained group of air traffic controllers. It could take years. So 60 hours a week. That's crazy, especially in a job where life and death uh, hang in the balance. And you would think they would give people like maybe a six hour shift, make sure you're alert, you're aware, you have a, sh- you know, it's a shorter shift, you're not sitting there looking at a screen for eight hours, you make sure that you know, the person's eyes aren't going blurry or that their attention isn't diverted. That just seems 60 hour weeks for those folks, a lot. Yeah. And, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a problem, because there were a bunch of close calls. Mm-hmm. And they decided to um, change the shifts a little bit with air traffic controllers, but they changed the shifts despite research that shows that people can nap on a really long shift and be rejuvenated. There's tons of research on this. They didn't allow any napping. So, you know, Even on a stakeout or something when those cops are just sitting there doing and they're not landing planes, you know, one guy's sleeping while the other person is awake type thing. They take shifts. This is the case in in most of just 15 minute rest. I believe that's what the research indicated can really be the difference between being alert and not alert. So anyway, uh, the FAA did address that when they, as I say, at the at the beginning of um, the 2000s because there were a string of near misses, but um, now it's happening again. And uh, as I say, there were some problems with the way they addressed it the first time, but now, again, overworked, understaffed, uh, all the red flags are there. They were testifying yesterday. We are sounding the alarm bells and we need action. Frankly, I don't want to hear about more meetings. I don't want to hear about conferences. I don't want to hear about summits. God damn it. Do something. Mm -hmm. This was said by, um, I believe it's the NTSB director, maybe? The board's chair, yeah. The chair of the NTSB. Uh, Sharon Kidd, $50. Mark, you have a great team there. Have fun. She had fun in Hawaii listening to replays. Huge hugs. To you and Kim, big shout out, Sharon. Big shout out. Sharon is one of our 
Tr yeah. Thank you so much for your generosity, too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, thank you uh, so much. She, yes. she has a Mark Thompson show pillow, and she took it to Hawaii with her. And that was sent so us, cool. Oh, did you just see that? Yeah, she sent us pictures of the of the pillow on the plane and the pillow near a tiki, and that's kind of cute. Yeah. There's a throw pillow back behind me. You yeah. can see it. It's available on the website, getmarkmerch.com. Perfect for Christmas. Yeah. It's eclipsed by the uh, wall of mugs, but uh, you can <laughs> find it. Harry, the Kim McAllister show is always good. I agree, mm. and she's going to have one on Monday morning. So we're all looking forward to that. Big shout out, Harry. Big shout out. And thank you, Doug. Also, another super sticker for a fiver. Big shout out. Wow, we're finishing strong on a Friday. Yeah. But that's the word on. Thanks, you guys. What's happening? The FAA met a goal of hiring 1,500 controllers this year and is aiming to recruit another 1,800 next year. But Ted Cruz, you remember Ted Cruz from Texas? Yeah. Ted Cruz, the Republican from Texas. Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back to Texas. He's a said traveler. Even if he likes eight, to hang out in if, Cancun, right? Mexico? Yeah, he, place, that's yeah. where he was. Yeah, you know, yeah. well, the kids had uh, school or whatever. Sure, what is the yeah. um, kids have the school, and there's nothing break. we can. Yeah, uh, yeah it was something like that. It was, it was obviously a mistake. In hindsight, I, thought, yeah. I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are high as a kite. I'm a little bit buzzed, but not high as a kite. I say even if the agency meets its goals, it can expect to lose almost one-third of new hires as they progress through training, says Ted mm. Cruz, adding that it'll take years for the agency to be fully staffed. Senators have proposed constructing a second training academy to help boost hiring. Maybe they could do that in Mexico with, uh, you know, Ted Cruz knows all the good places down there. It was obviously a mistake, and in okay. hindsight, all I wouldn't right. have done it. Asked whether he was concerned that the scheduling uh, controller strategy um, requiring them to work. Tim Errol, head of the FAA's Air Traffic Control Division, said after the hearing that the agency is studying this issue of staffing. We have negotiated procedures that are based on human factors, he said. We have in place a minimum time between shifts and a maximum amount of hours worked. We make sure that we adhere to that so they have processes and pro have processes pro and protocols and standards exactly um anyway this is a real watershed type um testimony that we saw yesterday and it's lost in a lot of the fog or the other politics of capitol hill especially when you're looking at the very likely narrative that would involve the government closing down next week so uh, it's against that backdrop. And by the way, the government can, can, can shut down. They'll still staff air traffic controllers, beleaguered though they may be. Beleaguered would be a ding word. But I, I would make the point that they'll be working without a paycheck. Then they'll get their, their pay. It's, it's a crazy system that we have, the appropriation system, but that's what we are looking at. And with a house that's being really held hostage by the Republicans, in my judgment, by, by intense alt-right, you know, government is bad, Republicans, I mean, any government is bad, they view the shutdown of the government as maybe not a bad thing. They also view the shutdown of the government as something that creates issues for Joe Biden and that helps Republicans, is the thought. The reality is, I think, that the Republicans are going to get tagged with this government shutdown. Now, maybe voters will forget it by the time the general rolls around, but it's a bad look. And uh, anyway, we'll talk more about that with uh, with Avila and Shore when they get here. Smash the like button, if you would, please, smash for me. Smash it with your iron rod. It's free, the like button. You just smash, smash it like it a boss. with your iron rod. And it helps us in the algorithms of YouTube. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do to help us, and doesn't involve money, is share segments from the show, share the whole show, however you want to do it. Just hit the share, the little arrow, you hit the share, and then share it on your Facebook page. Maybe it's a video. Maybe it's yesterday's conversation with George Slaughter. Somebody really liked the conversation with George Slaughter yesterday and I think joined our Patreon as a result. Oh, really nice. Yeah, it was really cool. Sent me a note. Also, um, yeah, in replay, I got a couple of uh, people really enjoying that George Slaughter thing. So if you liked uh, that. How about Lee Cop? Lee, a nice, truly big shout out. Devoted listener and viewer. Yeah. Thank you, Lee and Eileen. For a 20, 
Thank you so, so much. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so, so much. All right, everybody, let's, um, uh, I guess I've got to, I'll tell the story with the car at some point. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, but I have Kim's news to do. So we'll do Kim's news, then John Daly joins, Friday Fabulous Florida. Much to do. Smash the like button if you would be so kind. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and this report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Israeli troops are pushing deeper into Gaza as the war with Hamas is continuing. Local health officials in Gaza say there's been intense bombing and the presence of military vehicles near hospitals. That's what they say. Yesterday, President Biden said Israel is agreeing to uh, uh, Israel agreeing to daily four hour pauses to allow civilians to leave the area was a step in the right direction. U.S. government is facing another potential shutdown. Congress needs to pass legislation to fund the government by November 17th. Newly elected House Speaker Mike Johnson has yet to lay out his plans for a short-term spending plan to avert a shutdown. They have these envelopes with a suspicious powdery substance found at election offices in states across the country. Authorities in Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Georgia are investigating envelopes all received this week. In uh, Washington, Spokane police say an initial test of a white powdery substance in one envelope sent to the county elections office was confirmed to have traces of fentanyl in it, while Tacoma police say their letter only tested positive for baking soda. So who knows? Well, this is the next thing that's done to intimidate those who volunteer or are paid, you know, a modest amount for public service. You intimidate them if they're involved with the vote. I mean, this is good old American voter intimidation, Mm -mm. but by way of intimidating those who handle the vote. And then eventually you won't have the desire on the part of people to actually work in public service in this way because they're too intimidated and scared. And so those jobs will be taken by those who are in on what is essentially, it's a manipulation of the vote. It's a manipulation of the people's voice. In Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, the city says it did not file charges against the riverboat co-captain who was attacked along the riverfront last summer. Remember that? They had an incredible video of this brawl between two boat captains. Oh, yeah. Um, mm, the third degree assault charges were pressed against the co-captain, according to records. And he is due in court on November 1st, but no charges against the riverboat co-captain. Wow. Uh, Sacramento claims it is pushing back against fake news beginning next year. A new Democratic-backed California law mandates that schools require all K-12 through students to learn media literacy skills, including critical thinking when en- encountering a story on the Internet and recognizing when it might be fake. Instead of a standalone curriculum, the lessons will be weaved into existing classes through the school year. Help is needed to find a hate crime suspect who ran over a Stanford student and then took off. Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office shared a sketch of him yesterday. They're asking anyone to everyone to take a good look. This victim says the guy yelled a racist slur, then struck him on purpose last Friday as he was walking to class. The student is Arab Muslim and believes he was targeted for wearing a shirt with Arabic writing. Deputies are searching for a black Toyota SUV with a tire mounted on the back that should have side bumper damage from a crash. In San Jose, they're making sure a former police officer never serves again. Officials have started a decertification process for Mark McNamara. He resigned one week ago today, just hours before the public got a look at racist texts he allegedly wrote. Some messages followed a marked shooting where he wounded a man outside of a restaurant. Others came after he was deposed in a lawsuit claiming he used excessive force. The police chief agrees McNamara should not be an officer anywhere and says the uh, cases he was involved in are now all being reviewed.
And lastly, an American World War II pilot is finally getting a proper burial on this Veterans Day, more than 80 years after he was declared missing in action. His name is Gilbert Myers, and he was a second lieutenant for the U.S. Army Air Force when his plane went down, uh, was shot down in Italy in 1943. Now DNA evidence has helped identify the Pennsylvania native, and he was laid to rest in St. Petersburg earlier this morning. This report is sponsored by the amazing people at Tenuta Vineyards. Check this out. Today is the day you'd want to be sitting right in front of that flight of wine, in front of that beautiful vineyard, looking at that vista. Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore is just the most wonderful place where if you give them 30 minutes, they'll say uh, you'll be friends for life. They've got 28 varietals, 14 reds, 14 whites, and that includes the Mark Thompson, Why Are You Yelling Red? Wow. Hey, why are you yelling? Uh, And it is awesome. If you are a Mark Thompson show listener or viewer, which you are, you get 10% off. 10% off of anything sold at Tenuta Vineyards. And I got a message last night that uh, one of our, our members of the Mark Thompson show community ordered the Why Are You Yelling Red, got it in the mail, uh, I don't know if they tried it yet, mm. uh, but yeah, ten percent. So you enter at checkout, or you no, I'm sorry, you don't enter at checkout. You call and you say, "Smash, smash it. it with your iron rod." I don't know why we can't do it. Enter at a checkout. Maybe it's too complicated. You because they want it, you to say it with gusto. They want this real dedication. Fun, yeah, yeah. I see. Smash it it's a perf- with your iron rod. It's a kind of performance, like American Idol sort of That's thing. That's right. America's Got Talent. But all you do is you say the smash it with your iron rod, mm-hmm. and then you get your 10%, 10% off. 10% off everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 10% off, and it's going to be amazing when you get your uh, your Mark Thompson, hey, why are you, wait, hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson, Pino Grigio, uh, yeah. and the why are you yelling red? I got it. I got hey, it. Hey, which one of you is Mark Thompson? Right. Get exactly. your 10% off. So you call the fine folks at Tenuta Vineyards. It is uh, 925-699-4576. It's fantastic. You say, okay. Hey, which uh, you say, well, smash it with your iron rod. That's what yeah. you say. And then you yeah. get your, your discount and you're good to go. You seem to be struggling with the pitch a little oh, bit today. God, I am. Yeah, What's wrong I don't know with me? There's never been anything like I don't know. had well, too I just... much of the, hey, why are you yelling red? I guess. There seems to be something. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm just saying. Have another drink, Kim. On. Have another sippy sip. <laughs> what can the you tell us about cup? the scene? I don't know. It's Larry, it looks like Kim's a little bit on the <laughs> woozy side. What can you tell us about the yeah, scene? Right. I'm Kim McAllister, and it is The Mark Thompson Show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. Oh, yes. We are a little behind, so I want to uh, welcome at this moment. Look at that. Choices to Noodle Vineyard. All that stuff still up there, Kim. I Sorry. think we're... Uh, Listen. Kim is working everything today. There's no backstop. There's no Albert. There's no Tony. <laughs> if only a producer could have been called upon. I could have called John. He, I, I, feel, I don't do that anymore, man. I don't produce your show. He would have said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous producer, John Daly. He is a fabulous producer, John yeah. Daly. How about it for John Daly, everybody? Yeah. Yeah, Woo! yeah we got to let him into the... Oh, that's where I have to put him, him on. Yeah, there yeah, you go. There it right. is. Oh, well, that was good to do it again, and then you take him out. Wait, I put him, put him in. in. Do you want to put him in? Then I'm put gonna, him in. I'm putting him in. Jeez, man. Jesus so Christ. Whoever is, whoever, <laughs> whoever <laughs> is producing this thing has no idea what they're doing. Kim is the producer of record on the show today. So the issues not right a producer. to her. Talk I'm about the talent. Of ownership. <laughs> yeah, please. Gosh. Yeah. Kim, how are you? Really? My paycheck stopped a year ago, and I'm still showing up. What's up yeah, with Kim? How about that? Kim is uh, wakey wakey. <laughs> you know, Mark, you were you were talking about Mitch McConnell, and I think you coined a new term: stand-up strokes. It's like, yes. What's the w- deal with the filibuster? <laughs> <laughs> I think between those stand-up strokes, he's still uh, doing the you know Satan's work, which is. Uh, <laughs> uh, Debbie says, "Hey there, uh, Fabulous producer John Daly. Hi, John. You get all these Hello. highs and hellos yeah. and." Um, uh, it's very cool how the audience letters. does love you. They remember you, you know, which is a very cool thing. John was the producer of the show for a long time and really helped us uh, get us up and going here on the YouTube platform. So, um, Kim, are you ready to run? You'll have to run the open and the close of Friday Fabulous Florida. Do you know how to do it? Do you know where I, it is? Are you I ready think, with it? I think I'm I'm going to be successful. Can uh, you get her a cup of coffee? I mean, Kim, how are you? Um, 
All you right. ready for it now? In uh, three? Uh, I'll call for it, Kim. Jesus. It's oh her first God. time. It's <laughs> like she's never been on the stinking show Florida, before. Florida, fabulous. Every time. Every single time. Friday. She's just learned what the segment's called. She just has <laughs> begun to get that Kim, right. Kim, how are you? Uh, ch 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 all right. <laughs> uh, on Fridays, we like to look at a state that uh, serves up the bizarre, serves up the scary, serves up the depressing. It serves it all up. This is Friday Fabulous Florida. It's time for Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. <laughs> A look at the weirdest stories from our weirdest state. And, of course, uh, John Daly is with us as well as he uh, ducks in for Friday Fabulous Florida. These stories curated by our stalwart producer, Albert, who is on his uh, way to Asia right now. But he left us with uh, this pretty good selection from Florida. It contains a lot of news of reptiles. Albert, thank you. Yeah. A nine-foot alligator bites a Florida woman's face no. while she's snorkeling. <laughs> I saw her head in its mouth, according to this friend. She's snorkeling with a friend at Alexander Springs Recreation Area over the weekend. A nine-foot alligator attacks her and bites her forehead. Ow. Marissa Carr saying that she still cannot believe that an alligator bit her in the face. She was out with a friend snorkeling and swimming at this Alexander Springs Recreation Area near Ocala. I rip the mask off and I turn and I see the two little eyes sticking out of the water. <laughs> and that's when I realized face to face with a nine foot alligator. I just heard a rush of water, and I turned around to make sure she was okay, said a friend. And I just saw the huge gator, and I saw her head in its mouth. That's going to leave a mark. Marissa said it all happened in a matter of seconds, Kim. So fast that she didn't realize the alligator had bitten her in the first place. The body goes into shock, Kim. Yeah. Have you ever been in these situations, Kim? <laughs> Not, no, never had a, my head in an alligator's mouth. Eye to no. eye yeah. with maybe the end. It didn't hurt bad in the moment, she said. And then, like, as I was running back and, like, I saw what it was, like, that's well, when it started California. hurting, she said. She's I was Calvary. like, my forehead hurts really <laughs> bad and my <laughs> neck isn't, like, like, so much of the pain. Like... Maybe she didn't say like at all before the incident, John. Did it ever occur to you that this incident might have actually affected her, the way she articulates? And she became Californian in that moment. Mm -mm. Sounds bad, but it biting my head is probably like the best place that it could have been. Because like, if you would have got my arm and that it would have like got a better grip on my arm and I could have like lost my arm or just like my life in general. So like, I think the head, he didn't get a good grip of it. So I think like, I'm genuinely just really, really lucky. And that, yeah. Uh, yeah. She's right. like, just don't eat my body, you know, head's okay. Yeah. But don't you find it surprising these people are like, oh, I was surprised. I, why are you surprised? You well, went swimming <laughs> in a lake in Florida. I couldn't believe there was an alligator in there. Yeah. Turn well, on a TV. Maybe it was supposed to be alligator free. Yeah, right. It's like really, really section. scary, a Florida woman <laughs> says, as she sells her home in Florida. But why she's selling her home is the key here. Alligator? This is Cape Coral. And a woman is saying that she is putting her home up for sale because her dog came face to face with a massive what? Alligator. Uh, alligator head. is what I would have guessed. Python Method. was the name oh. and the, uh, rather the uh, name of the creature. We were, yeah. You guess Python, you can award yourself points. Her dog came face to face with this massive Python in her backyard. In um, uh, Cape, Cape Coral. Yeah, Cape Coral. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lexi Pantalip was at her home minding her own business. She heard her dog, Kane, start barking outside. She says what that is it? what is it's it, boy? normal for her dog, but then he yelped, and that's when she 
ran out and saw the slippery intruder. She went into the backyard. She saw her dog and a massive snake about to go head to head. He was face to face. I've seen a little water moccasin before, she said, but I've not seen snakes that are so huge. He was standing right there. And the end of his body was still in the grasses. You couldn't really see where his body ended. This is the Burmese python down there. We've talked about it before. It becomes a repetitive thing. It's an invasive species. It's not native to Florida. Yeah. That means, right? And, you know, yeah. some human brought in this exotic thing. It got out of a tank or whatever the cage was. And now you've got. Have you seen one of these giant snakes in person, a python? No. I, I saw one on the islands of uh, uh, Thailand. And at first, I just thought it was a pipe like going across the street because it was like a narrow street, like a paved path in the, in the forest. I thought it was a pipe. And then the locals are yelling. And they're yelling at me in Thai. <laughs> like, and then wow. I figure out, oh, producer, oh. John Daly. Wow. He couldn't even tell it was a snake. It was so huge. There it is, man. Yeah. But she's moving out. She's had enough. And uh, she wants no more Florida. She's moving to she, Texas? Well. Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back to Texas. It could be. It could be. Um. Meantime, on the other side of town, a Florida man is busted with five alligators in his bathtub. Oh, come that he on. He told authorities that he had rescued <laughs> at a nearby pond. The man's from St. Cloud, and he was discovered having five alligators in a bathtub. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission descended on their little things, you know. Um, officers got an anonymous tip that he was keeping these juvenile alligators in a bathtub at his home and uh, told officers that he did have the alligators in his home oh. and also gave them permission to go inside and check it out. There they are, if you're watching. Inside the bathroom in Robinson's bedroom, officers found five alligators inside the bathtub. They double-checked the other rooms in the house because... You know, usually they're more than just the gators, but they grab the gators. How old do you think he is to do this? This is a, one of those questions where, like, how old mm. do you think the guy is in Florida who is grabbing these juvenile gators out of a pond, putting them in his tub? You've got to have time to do that and the inclination to do it. How old, I ask you in the chat, if, yeah, how old is the dude who grabbed five gators from a nearby pond. At what age does that kick in? Everybody's going 40, Julie. 40 says Edward, Julie says, uh, I don't know. Makai says 85, Pauline says 32, huge in Japan. Uh, higher, I believe, 23, 37. Who gets 37? Nancy. I'm going to give it to you, Nancy. Wow. 38 was the answer. I was going to guess either really young or retired. Right. At the and me too. I, yeah. I actually um, felt like, oh, it's probably a retired guy who's, you know. Hey, no. ladies. Want to go to an after party? <laughs> <laughs> want to see five alligators, ladies? <laughs> um, so that is a 38-year-old guy with too much time on his hands. A Florida man is tased and arrested. After firing a gun in the air while drunk, he's a 37-year-old, tased and arrested. Deputies said he fired a gun in public, and he was, of course, intoxicated. So, Robert Matthew Phillips of Punta Gorda faces charges of discharging a weapon in public, possession of a firearm while in the commission of a felony, and then a bunch of other firearm charges they threw in fleeing and eluding, uh, assault, DUI, there he is. Also Not a bad booking photo, actually. 37, that's the sweet spot. That is, <laughs> a, in this particular Florida offering, that is a the perfect age. Yeah. I feel like he looks like he's been, had a hard night and been drinking a little bit. Kind well, of his face is kind of ruddy. Well, he's been in the sun, too, I think. He Looking is like definitely. A, I'd be willing yeah. to bet well, my lunch I, that I, there's alcohol I told involved. you that alcohol was involved. So yeah. he was seen riding a bike in the area. Yeah. But he didn't yeah. stop when ordered to by deputies. Authorities said that he was shocked with a taser as he continued to resist arrest. 
After searching him, cops say they found a loaded 40 caliber Glock handgun. Oh, scary. This is one of those Mad Libs stories. <laughs> Fill in the blanks, Mark. All right. They searched him further, and they found a boa constrictor in his right leg. Wow, that's amazing. They searched him further, and on his right leg, there was fentanyl strapped to his hand, strapped to his uh, calf. Investigators said the bullet casings were found at the crime scene, matched those in the gun, formerly in Phillips' position. That's, uh, that's how I know they know he discharged it, and he is in custody. Four doctors eating dinner are witness to a guy suffering a heart attack at the next table. Guy is there with his grandchildren, and he suffers a heart attack. What did the four doctors eating dinner in Florida do? Nothing. That would be the answer that I wouldn't be surprised by. The answer is they did help, though, John. Uh, I, uh, it, was uh, a a it was a little misdirection I was doing. It was a little misdirection. This guy was in the right place, yeah. suffered a heart attack, out to dinner with his family, and there were four doctors at the next table. So Eddie Montero visiting his daughters and meeting one of his grandchildren for the first time in the Lake Nona region of Orlando, Florida, was able to... Uh, Get help when he went into cardiac arrest. A local physician and three of her residents were finishing up their meal and quickly sprang into action. Dr. Nicole Brenner, a physician at Florida's, is it Osceola, Florida? Is Osceola. that where it is, John? Osceola, yeah, yeah the county. Um, they all jumped into medical mode and they saved his life. Yeah. Check pulse, provided medical care and life was good. At least they didn't debate what it was. You know, just standing there. <laughs> Nobody do anything. Right, right. <laughs> Let's figure out what we have here. Like a like an episode of House. A Florida man raised thousands on GoFundMe after his husband was killed. Months later, he's charged with the murder. No. What? Oh, wow. That's right. He raised thousands of dollars on GoFundMe after his husband was found slain in their home in March. Now he's been charged with first-degree murder. Herbert Swilly, 55 years old, arrested by the Marion County Sheriff's Office. It's a brutal situation. What he's got going here is a situation. He does have a brutal situation for Swilly, who requested a welfare check when he found... A Jeep outside one of their two homes a day after he said that he'd last seen his husband um, that prior day. Police were eventually able to go inside the resident residence and found Smith, who's the former husband, 59 this is a years old. picture of Smith. Oh, oh that's Smith? Okay. Mm -hmm. he, he actually was on wanted a, a welfare check, like an actual welfare check. He wanted, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Ahead of his GoFundMe check. Yeah. Um, he had ligature marks on his neck and uh, autopsy determining that Smith, that nice looking fellow that Kim showed you, died from asphyxia, which is a ding word, and it's also a tough way to die, um, and a fracture well, unless he, on- Unless he was enjoying it. On a fracture on his cervical spine, according to the affidavit. Doesn't sound like a lot of enjoyment, maybe. Yeah. Swilly, though, is getting charged with the first degree premeditated murder and one charge of tampering with evidence. And so he could be going away for quite some time. And uh, might I say, with that, we need to pick a favorite. I don't want to do... Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm so sorry. We don't need to pick... No, no. Uh -oh. I apologize. We're not done. Who are you going to okay. apologize to? The floor... I want to... Mm. My words upset so many people. I wonder who yeah. I should have. My words upset yeah, so okay. many people. I'm going to apologize to the Asian community. And I wanted to apologize yeah. to the Asian community, right. the Asian American community. community. I just feel like that you always yeah. should apologize if you can to the Asian community. <laughs> uh, Florida man helps take down a carjacking suspect in a Starbucks drive through Wow. It's usually <laughs> so boring at Starbucks drive throughs Not in Florida, it's not. Ocala, Florida. Police chase ended near an Ocala Starbucks suspect tried to carjack a woman's car there at Starbucks. 
A man in the next car jumped in to help, held on to the suspect until the cops got there. Wow. Why are you yelling? Shane Spicer was waiting for coffee. Police, at the meantime, were in a high-speed chase with a dangerous suspect. The suspect was wanted for allegedly breaking into somebody's home and stealing their car, crashed in a busy intersection, and took off running. Sprinting up to Starbucks, he didn't look like a Starbucks coffee drinker, <laughs> said, <laughs> said the Good Samaritan Spicer. More like a meth smoker. Then he yanked the girl out of the car. The guy was running from the cops. And dash cam video, which you've just been able to see a little bit if you're watching, shows him trying to carjack this woman, but this dude, Spicer, jumps into the passenger seat to stop him. Spicer's an Army veteran and decided that he wasn't going to let this guy slip away. I'm going to get you, buddy, he said. You're not going anywhere now. You cross you, the line. That's right. So... What he's got going here hmm. is a situation. Yeah. That's the he's, third story from Fox 35 Orlando. Orlando. Shout out. Yeah. You remember stuff. Fox 35 and the Fox 35 Thunder Truck? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'd forgotten it was yeah. them. Thank you. Your leading source. Um, Florida big, news. big news at that Starbucks in Florida. And a Florida man finally hits the haunted house host with a BB gun. He's firing his BB gun. Hit the guy in the eye oh. with this airsoft gun. I mean, those BBs hurt, and not to mention that you can oh, literally put your eye out. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then he laughed when he realized the victim was not a statue. Oh, man. This dude is 20 years old. He was down at a local haunted house, and he donned an FBI jacket, I guess, body armor, and he was carrying an airsoft BB gun resembling a Glock pistol. He entered this Seminole, Florida home of a 47-year-old man that was hosting a, a free haunted house event at his home. The haunted house was advertised with the question, are you brave enough to make it through the manor and get some treats? The front lawn of the house is decorated to appear as a cemetery. Inside the home, police said this guy who's 6'4 and 2'10", went around a corner to where the victim was standing. The victim was wearing a costume, but was not acting like a scary player at the time, according to witnesses. After seeing the costume individual, Schuster reportedly turned away, grabbed his airsoft gun, and then hit the victim in the eye with the gun's handle, oh. causing significant injury. Schuster told the victim that he thought he was a statue. After realizing that he'd hit a person, not a decoration, not a statue, Schuster, again, he's the perpetrator here, began laughing, was not apologetic. And as the victim bled out, the dude Schuster ran. Then they tried to block him from leaving, and finally emergency responders showed up, mm -hmm. and Schuster was booked in the local jail. He was released on bond of $15,000. There he is. That's his booking photo. Not to blame the victim, but you should not be inviting people into your house if you live in Florida. I <laughs> <laughs> At night on Halloween? No. No. He's not wrong, John, is not wrong with, no. that, uh, with that pro tip. Uh, we don't like to do it, but we have to do it. It's in the bylaws of the show to pick a favorite. So let's mm -hmm. just review for them, yeah. for you uh, quickly, all of them. And what I was going to say as well is if you're watching in replay, please indicate your favorite in comments. We just like to... Keep track of that. And again, we're duty bound to do that by the by bylaws of the show. Florida's featured this today. A nine foot alligator biting that Florida woman's face while she was snorkeling. And like I tell you, it could have been like worse. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> really scary. A Florida a woman ready to sell her home. She is too scared after a huge python goes face to face with her dog. A Florida man busted. He was the 38-year-old with the five alligators in his bathtub that he says he rescued from a nearby pond. A Florida man is tased and arrested after firing a gun in the air while drunk. Four doctors eating dinner save another Florida man at the next table as he suffers a heart attack 
while meeting his grandkid for the first time. That story has it all. It's got life, death, the warmth of meeting your grandchildren. You know <laughs> what I mean, John? Yeah, yeah it's a movie. Yeah. Hallmark a Channel. Florida man who raised thousands on GoFundMe after his husband was killed, tragically. Now charged with tragically killing his husband, everyone. Yes, that is the way. He got uh, greedy. Florida man helps take down a carjacking suspect in the Starbucks drive through And finally, the Florida man who took on the haunted house with a BB gun and uh, says he thought that the proprietor of the haunted house was a statue and he lashed out. Uh, his explanation doesn't really hold water. So anyway, the haunted house <laughs> assault is what we'll call that. Um, I don't believe there's a poll up in the chat. So no, we'll just register. I've, been, I've yeah. been looking at the chat and unofficially, I'm going to say it's the gator woman head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That Alligator like bite, berry. face bite. Someone called it a, uh, uh, what did Heather say? Gator face hugger. Yeah. Mm. It looks like the gator face. Gator face is winning. Starbucks, uh, good Samaritan with tattoos. Gator face says Heather. Yeah. yeah. Leaving Florida because of Python, says A. Well, yeah. let's see. There's a lot there to uh, mm -hmm. go fund me. That is the, I, that's a twist, and it's kind of dastardly and cold-hearted, <laughs> sort of very Florida. Um, the Gator Woman's eloquence was, like, amazing, says Harry. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we don't like to pick a favorite, as I say, but we must. Kim, I'll start with you. Gator face. Gator yeah. face. Kim, how are you? All right. Uh Fabulous producer John Daly, what do you think? Yeah, I have to go with Fabulous that producer, alligator John face Daly. chomp because I feel like the alligator was doing us like a favor, and he's like, mm. shh, 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 shh. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> alligator face chomp is tough to beat. Alligator, yeah. you've got you know she wasn't killed, which is good. It makes the story a little bit more palatable. I think. Yeah, if her head came off, it would have been a different. Story. Yeah, then I would have you know. Um, there is, all right, uh, I'm going to go with the two. It's uh, yeah. the alligator charm. Like, the, totally. yeah. I think it's a unanimous, that's the first time it's unanimous. It's like yeah. unanimous. Wow. It is. That's what happens when Albert goes away. We can all agree on something. Right? Albert, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Friday Fabulous Florida. This has been Friday Fabulous Florida. There is a gigantic alligator in my kitchen. <laughs> Y'all come back now, here. You can find fabulous producer John Daly fabulous on producer the Daly. After Party Live. Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. do it live. No. I can all write it and we'll do it live. And so, hopefully Kim will sober up by then. Well, and you know, coffee. Kim uh, has done a lot on this show, John, so I'm asking that you go a little bit easier on her. Oh, I, I do. You know. And Her I guest don't... the other day uh, said that she never makes any mistakes. <laughs> I thought that was really I funny. totally make mistakes. Uh, I got my, why are really... you yelling red? I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah, like the why are you yelling red? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rod Jamison, thank you. 20 bucks says Gatorhead. Exactly. Thank you yeah. for the super chat from Rod. Yeah, Gatorhead Yay, is the Rod. winner. Big shout out, Rod. Big shout out. Thank you for the uh, donation. You know, we're crowdfunded. Are you crowdfunded over on that uh, After Party Live, John? In, in, in theory, yes. Right yes, we are. <laughs> you what, you watch that, buddy? What? In theory, in theory. We're the little in show theory? that could, yeah. hopefully. You're the little show. That, you we have a lot of stay with it. It is a, This is a brutal platform. Although you, we you know, posted a short yesterday, and it has 5,000 views. It just, that's, like, and got that will sucked help. up. That'll yeah. help your... Um, yeah, 17 yeah, new subscribers, subscribers from that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, John Daly, everybody. See you, John. See you. Bye, John Daly. We love you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ken. Love you. Yeah, I love that, uh, <laughs> love that John Daly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Mark Thompson Show. On Fridays, we like to welcome in uh, two guys who just are so good with political analysis, and I'm grateful to them every Friday. Uh, this guy has uh, forgotten more about politics than most of us will ever know. You may have seen him from COVID wards to Trump rallies, now over on TYT, I think, from time to time. He's the great Michael Shore, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Oh, yeah. And uh, the uh, former senior correspondent at ABC News, reported White House correspondent for many years as well, award-winning journalist Jim Avila, everybody. Jim Avila. 
Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, nice to see you both, and thank you for Jim's being here. Surfboard. See Jim surfboard back there. Yeah, Jim's got yeah. a um, it's a beachy background that he's got, yeah. and uh, you well, know, I'm in San Diego today, so yeah, so uh, it seems right. Uh, yeah. Gentlemen, the uh, I think the news and I will have the... a special announcement next week, Mark. Oh, a special announcement! We haven't done a special announcement here in a in a long time. I think Kim, it's been when was the last time we did a we did a, we call them major announcements here? Okay, um, a major announcement. Yeah, so we we haven't That's done one. I want to see. I, I really want to say it's been I'd a couple. Like, of... I'd like to know a little bit. Can I have a hint? Anything? Nothing? I, I, I don't be, wanna, I, I, go ahead. We'll be announced wanna, yeah. here in San Diego and perhaps in other columns, other places. Oh, yeah. Okay. Kim, how are you? If okay. nominated, if nominated, I will not run. <laughs> Jim Avila is running for the Senate seat in that California, everybody. Yes. Not true. <laughs> no, oh, absolutely no. <laughs> not. I'll leave that <laughs> okay. to the former KTLA reporters. I now know what it is. It's uh, interesting. Oh my gosh! This is this is wild. Major announcement. <laughs> there we go. I just it's to not, not today. Not today. How do we get off on this major announcement thing? All right. So um, that'll be next week. Uh, what I'd like to start with this week is the uh, the news from Joe Manchin that. Uh, comes at a time, of course, that the Democrats who've complained about Joe Manchin, he's such an impediment to so much, but he does have a D in front of his name. Um, he has uh, said that he's leaving the Senate, and that will open up a seat in the Senate in red West Virginia. And you've talked about this, Michael. I know, um, I think, Jim, you've weighed in as well, but I remember distinctly Michael revisiting often the fact that despite the fact that Democrats complain about Joe Manchin, the D in front of his name has given the Democrats great advantage through the years that he served. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it, he is uh, he is part of the reason the Democrats have the majority. He's one, you know, 51st of that. The Democrats don't hold the White House. They're able to hold their other Senate seats, but the Republicans win this Senate seat. Uh, you know, but but the Democrats were to lose the White House. This would give control of the Senate to uh, the Republicans. If everything stays the same. I mean, he is a Democrat. Uh, he's not the kind of Democrat that a lot of Democrats like to consider a Democrat. He's a very faint D. You know, when you do the COVID test, you get that <laughs> positive. Uh, he's got that faint positive there. And, and uh, you know, it's this is, uh, I would say, a part of the, and I, I, I don't throw these compliments around uh, on bias. I throw them. Mitch McConnell's very good at his job. Mitch McConnell realized that Jim Justice would be somebody who could beat Joe Manchin uh, and give the Republicans back their, um, their majority. He went into West Virginia, tried very hard, along with Steve Daines from Montana, who runs the Republican Senate campaign committee. And they said, look, we, we, we need you to run, Jim. Uh, and and that is why Joe Manchin is leaving, because it really does not look like he could pull well. And it means that now you have to look at places like Texas uh, and Ted Cruz or Florida and Rick Scott to see a Democratic pickup. So I wouldn't say it's uh, those are rosy skies. And Montana means they have to hold John Tester. Ohio means they have to hold Sherrod Brown. Nevada means they have to hold on to uh, the seat there. And so uh, it's it's tough sledding. Uh, what, what, before I, I hear from Jim, I'm so glad you mentioned the McConnell thing because it's so clear that uh, McConnell you know, laid the groundwork for this and made sure this happened. This is the 3D chess of politics that McConnell does very well. I mean, it's given him the Supreme Court after all. Um, I, I wonder if you can speak to, uh, was it Texas? I thought that there might even be a chance to, uh, to pick up a Democratic I mean, it's, seat. It's, I, I covered Beto O'Rourke's campaign when he ran six years ago or five years ago, whatever it was. And uh, I really thought he was a well-positioned, unique uh, sort of uh, politician. He was giving RFK senior like uh, speeches on the stump. He was, um, I think, getting national attention. While Colin Allred is a good candidate, uh, I don't see the magic there that's going to depose Ted Cruz unless the electorate has changed so much. Texas has been supposed to be turning blue now 
for the last, I don't know, 20 election cycles. Uh, it's not. It's a red state. And and I, I think it's going to be very tough there. Florida, also tough. Rick Scott's going to be there. It will be interesting to see how he's looked at. I, you know, but people criticize Joe Manchin. I've even seen in the comments here, good riddance. He's not a Democrat. He's a dino like a rhino. Uh, they're not wrong, the people that criticize him. I mean, he undid a lot of what Joe Biden tried to do along with Kirsten Sinema. But one thing to remember is the, the having the majority in the Senate is vitally important. It means that you chair all the committees, you set the agenda, and you're able to do a lot more business and also play more defense. So while you're not going to like every Democrat or every Republican, if you're a Republican, that majority is really important. And this is a big, big uh, hit that the Democrats take on keeping the majority. Yeah, I, 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 we've spoken about it before. And as I say, I remember you speaking about it often. Uh, Jim, what about just because we're on Manchin and, you know, Manchin takes more fossil fuel money than anybody else in Congress. And again, these are all things that you know don't speak so well for him, but probably are less bothersome maybe if you were to run as an independent. I mean, I'm talking about as a, a presidential candidate. He said he's not interested, but uh, I wonder if you could just give me a little bit of the arithmetic on the presidential side uh, in terms of a third party run or someone like Manchin who comes across as a moderate getting into that race for president? Well, how's he going to out moderate um, Joe Biden? I mean, he's not a threat to Joe Biden's main constituency. If there was a very good progressive candidate, that might be a threat uh, to Joe Biden. But there isn't. And I don't think Manchin is much of a threat at all, uh, as far as that. If you're going to go, if you're going to vote moderate, you're going to vote Joe Biden. Uh, he is. Manchin is in the pocket of every energy lobby in the country. He supports coal. He supports fouling our air. I don't know how you do that unless you have a monetary interest, which he does. Oil, you know. I, he also has a geographical interest. When you're the senator from West Virginia, you're going to be kinder to coal. But but that doesn't play nationally. Doesn't excuse it. Doesn't no. excuse what he's doing to our 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 uh, health and well-being. And I don't care where he's from. But I understand that he's playing to his audience. But mostly he's playing to the people who give him money. And that's where and that's what he's doing mostly. Um, so I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, good riddance. Now, I take Michael's point that this is going to make it much more difficult for the Senate in the Senate. But Democrats love to panic. Don't panic. I think Sherrod Brown's going to do very well. I think uh, uh, th that this these the Ohio election just recently showed uh, that Democrats are going to come out of the woodwork uh, to vote for people who support abortion rights. Uh, the Democrats are on a, on a winning streak, and they'll continue on that. Secondly, while the Senate is in more jeopardy, the House, very good chance that the House is going to turn over. They're going to lose Santos in, in, uh, in Long Island. They're going to lose several New York uh, congressional races that turned over in the last election. They're going to come back to being Democrats. They're going to spend a lot of money this time in those areas and bring them back. I think the House has a very good chance. And so even if you lose Manchin and you have Kamala Harris sitting up there or whoever the next Democrat vice president is, uh, probably uh, Kamala Harris, then you still have the Senate. It's still 50-50 and, and you have the Senate and you have the House and I believe you'll have the presidency. So Again, as I said before this last election on Tuesday, stop panicking, Democrats, and work. If you work and you get out that message about the policies that the Democrats support, they're going to win. Uh, I mean, that, I, that, that yeah, seems a little high in the sky, I have to say. You look at the map, you got to win Tester and Brown. Uh, you also have to hold on to the notion there wouldn't be an upset. Michigan, Debbie Stabenow's seat is a, is a possible upset. She's not running, but it's still a possible upset. Um, I think that there are no real 
places where the Democrats could pull the surprise. They've got North Dakota up. They've got Utah up. They've got Wyoming and Nebraska and Mississippi and, you know, Missouri, where some people thought, oh, maybe, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen. Indiana, not at all. I think that that's where the Democrats, you know, I, yes, they are negative. There's something realistic about this negativity. They have to win Arizona. They have to hold on to that seat uh, in order to make this happen. And Montana and Ohio have to come home for them as well. So it's, you know, it is a tougher map this time, Jim. Uh I don't disagree with that. I just don't think it's worth, at this point, throwing in the towel. And I think Arizona, of course, we're way ahead in Arizona. The Democrat is winning despite the fact uh, uh, that there's two candidates against him. Um, right. So I think Arizona is not a problem. I think Ohio, Sherrod Brown is not going to have an issue. Um, you know, I think you're right about Montana, Florida, Texas. Texas always looks promising and then fades away. Um, but Maybe this is the time and we ought to be working. Democrats ought to be working their message in those places and not throwing in the towel. Yeah. The uh, uh, the question as to whether or not the government will shut down goes back to the House and the new speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is heading. He, he will he adjourned the House early and he's headed to Paris. You know, they have this. Uh, there are going to be 22 speakers at um, this. They call it World Freedom Initiative, but like all the speakers are these like right wing, you know, autocrats. I mean, from Hungary, they, you know, they when when you if you're coming in from Hungary and you're the ruling party in Hungary, you're you know you're part of the autocracy of Hungary. I mean, it's a really uh, brutal scene right now. So, my, but my my point is twofold. One, please remark on that if if you'd like. I mean, this will be a. Uh, I mean, uh, Christy Nome's going to go to this, and um, uh, Alex Mooney, who's the uh, from West Virginia, and uh, 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 people from the Trump campaign are going to be there. Again, this is over in Paris, and Mike Johnson will be there. And the reason Johnson, I mean, in addition to it perhaps being interesting, is because he does have this. Uh, this problem, I mean, hanging over all of us uh, is the very real possibility of the government not being funded after the 17th. I wonder if you could speak to that, Michael. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think that is a very real problem and you can't run away from your problems entirely. But what Mike Johnson doesn't have on his resume is, is being a good fundraiser and being a good national party guy. And this is part of him building that up, even though it's international, it's going to Paris, it's high profile. And he has to start doing the work of being speaker, which means being the face of the Republican Party right now. Uh, and so it's an opportunity. It doesn't mean that the government shutdown is not happening. It doesn't mean there's great ammo for Democrats. But these are the sorts of situations that if it were reversed, Republicans would get great news cycles out of criticizing Mike Johnson or a Democratic speaker for going to Paris, right? Uh, I, it remains to be seen if that is part of the Democratic plan here. But in terms of PR, it isn't great PR. Uh, Johnson has said that he's exuded confidence that they're going to avert a shutdown. Uh, but th this is where, again, the frail hold that he has on, on his caucus is going to be tested during this. And there's no indication that anything has changed just because he's the speaker. The same people who have no problem shutting down the government over the issues uh, that were there before he was uh, elected speaker, that they're not gone. Those issues aren't gone. So it's hard to see how the Republicans are going, uh, are going to avoid being responsible for a government shutdown. And the, and the government shutdown is likely, isn't it, Jim Avila? Uh, somebody on, uh, on, sorry, right. unmute him. There you go. There we go. Um, yeah. we still he have the same problem. And we, we missed it because it was muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said something totally untrue. That's right, Michael. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't I love it Michael. when mommy and daddy fight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Not, go um, ahead at any rate, I, uh, I think what Michael says is true is that as long as you've got those naysayers in the, uh, in the Republican conference, how's this any better for this guy than it was for anybody else? Uh, in order to make a deal to keep keep open the uh, to keep open the government, he's going to have to make a deal with the Democrats. If he makes a deal with the Democrats, uh, that's going to cast his speakership in, in doubt already. It's so soon. 
So we're in the same position we were in before. Is uh, Johnson willing to throw away his speakership as as Kevin McCarthy was willing to do uh, by by making a deal with Democrats? We'll have to see. Uh, you know, he's a scary guy. Uh, he flies under the radar because you know he's uh, a quiet right wing fanatic, uh, but he is still remains a right wing fanatic uh, who barely has a bank account. So you know, it it is. We're in a scary place in the House, and it's really not going to be fixed until 2024 uh, when the Democrats take over the House. The So my question was about the likelihood of the government shutting down. It sounds to me, I mean, you've both articulated. I, think I said yes. You said yes, okay. Um, so that problem with with congress overseas it changes nothing i mean in other words I, I don't know how you get the coalition together to now they have this laddered you know budget which essentially suggests that it will the government will be funded in stages almost isn't that right michael yeah and that, that and so but that's not going to solve the, the inherent problem. The problem that the most conservative members of the Republican caucus have has nothing to do with any sort of system to keep the government open. It is a fundamental difference that they have, uh, that they are in a powerful minority within their own uh, majority in the House. Um, and so it's very, very tenuous. And so it, it doesn't matter if there are, um, at this point anyway, if there are any kind, if there's any kind of relief, right, if there's any kind of plan to keep it open, because to them, it's about fundamentals. It's not about some, you know, some, you know, cute way of keeping the government open. They are fundamentally opposed to the things that would be in there. I was just about to get to this. Thank you, Vilma. I heard somewhere that Trump was going to ask Tucker Carlson to be his running mate in 2024. What do you think of this, if it is true, Jim Avila. As long as Donald Trump is at the top of the ticket, I don't think it really matters who's on, who's below him. I think that uh, Donald Trump is uh, is a kryptonite, and that uh, as long as he's on the ballot, uh, the Republicans are not going to win, uh, and they need to be shaken up by a conviction in order for them to put a real candidate. If there was a if there was a moderate Republican candidate in the field right now who could who would win the primary, they could very easily win the general election. You know, Joe Biden's numbers are that bad. But as long as they have Donald Trump on the ticket, he's, his numbers are worse as far as negativity. So, you know, that, that doesn't matter. Tucker Carlson is there. You know, he appeals to the same 35% that Donald Trump appeals to and... That, that's not what he needs to do. He needs to find someone who appeals to independence into a broader section of even the Republican Party. And Tucker Carlson is not that guy. You know, uh, Michael Shore, Jim is so right about the, the fact that the Democrats did show up and they showed you in Ohio how they show up and they reminded us how powerful that rolling back of Roe was. But you know, when you actually look at the numbers, it was pretty close. I mean, it, you know, some of these uh, yeah, spots came yeah. down to just a handful of votes. Everything I mean, is close, but 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 right now, and everything in those states should be close. I mean, you're talking about winning a governor seat, a Democrat winning a governor seat in Kentucky. You're talking about Ohio and abortion. Uh, these are not states that are necessarily very blue ever. So these issues speak more than than anything. So uh, I'm not, you know. I'm not and it wasn't close in Ohio. It was. In it was Ohio, a it was, I'm just saying I'm not moved by, by where it was close, and it wasn't close in Ohio actually. That, but what I what I think you know, what happened on Tuesday tells or should tell Republicans, although they're pretty intransigent on the issue, is that Roe and abortion is something that is on the minds of many people. And to go back to your thesis question here, uh, if, if, if this is about Tucker Carlson, I don't think he's going to be the one to change minds on Roe or to soften the blow of Roe. I would imagine that you would see somebody like Christy Nome, for example, uh, as a better choice for, for Trump um, were he to, you know, get the nomination uh, i don't i don't know that he makes the best choice all the time either uh it, and and i and i just um i would just mention that um it was in the i guess the subpoenas associated with the 
uh, libel uh, damages of on Fox News, and I know that case now, everything seems like it was a million years ago, but, but the uh, revelations that came out of that was uh, were associated with uh, the fact that Tucker Carlson's communications revealed that he hated Donald Trump. He viewed him as a complete pain in the butt, uh, a joke, a moron. I mean, almost every disparaging thing you can say about another person was said by Tucker Carlson about Donald Trump. And, and Mark, I have to tell you that, that one thing we know about Donald Trump is he doesn't like getting upstaged. And Tucker Carlson is perhaps somebody who could upstage him. So I, I don't I don't see the fit there on a, on a you know, an interpersonal way either. It looks like we picked the first time. Mike Pence was certainly not going to upstage anybody. Right. No, no. It's such a good point. Yeah. So I think that is a very good point. One other point on the on abortion is that Youngkin tried very hard to fool the voters, to kind of smooth over what he really wanted uh, for abortion, not to come out as a flamethrower, to sweet talk uh, abortion in, in there so that he could get the the – uh, the House and the Senate in, in Virginia uh, to uh, vote for a 15-week uh, abortion ban or something along those lines. Women are not having it. Stay off my body is what they're saying. And that is a firm position. And as long as the Republicans, even if they try to soften, as long as they stay with that position, they're doomed. Yeah, it's interesting, Michael. That would seem to be uh, strategy remind uh, voters of that decision and who has control over the court and the yeah, courts I mean, uh, plural and, right and and if things stay as they are we start looking at Sonia Sotomayor's seat and a, another seat on the Supreme Court could become a campaign issue the Democrats are not as good at, at making the court an issue they're not as good as the Republicans are at doing that and that like Jim is saying it's it, it is and a campaign the ads will start as soon as the primaries are over, as soon as Donald Trump is announced. You will hear replayed, be played over and over. I'm responsible for Roe versus Wade. That's what Donald Trump says. He try, he's trying to backpedal now and soften his position. But he says, I'm the one who, who got Roe versus Wade overturned, and women will remember that. He's also the one who told uh, Chris Matthews back in the 2016 that he thought women should be prosecuted for having abortions. Those will be, he, he will be reminded of that every day and he will lose the election because of that and because of his stance against democracy. With that, I uh, will thank you guys. I, I, I did want to touch on one thing. Let me just do this quickly. It was the remarks that Trump made, public remarks he made about weaponizing the Justice Department and the fact that he would, he would go after his political rivals. Uh, were he to regain power. Uh, he backed into it by saying, well, they've weaponized it now, and I think if I were in power, I think now that that genie's out of the box is what he used, the, the I think it's genie out of the bottle, but all right. With Trump, it's genie out of the box. And, and he says, I think I would do that. I'd go out. Kim, do you have that? Tr Trump actually is making these comments publicly? He's, he's opened the Pandora's bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Kim, can you play it or not? No? Um, anyway, he says, um, um, well, he's unleashed something that everybody, we've, we've all known about this for 100 years, Trump says. Um, we've watched other countries do it, and in some cases effective, and in other cases the country's overthrown, or it's been totally ineffective. But we, you know, you, when you actually see the words, you see Trump's mind meandering through the, you know, the troubled logic. The bottom line with this stuff is that if independents have Trump fatigue, and fatigue of this period in political life that we're all living through, uh, this isn't going to help. The promise of uh, of further litigation and investigation and ethics and all of that, and and I, you know, I think it is red meat for his uh, followers and his supporters, uh, but it also, I think, is not something that most people want to hear, regardless of what party they're in, or you know, certainly independence, I should say. Sure, I mean, it, 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 it suggests a. Yeah, it suggests an, an autocrat, you know. Uh, here, I guess Jim, Kim, Kim's got it. They've weaponized real quick. the Justice Department. Fatigue. They've weaponized the FBI. And they've come at me with the worst indictments. If they want to follow through on this, uh, yeah, it could certainly happen in reverse. It could certainly happen in reverse. What they've done is they've 
released the genie out of the box. They have done something that allows the next party. I mean, if somebody, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. Mostly, that would be, you know, they would be out of business. They'd be out. They'd be out of the election. In my case, uh, it was, they were such pathetic indictments. Okay. okay. There you go. Then you got a sense just- of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're saying that doesn't land well with independence and independence. It's I, I don't that. think so. Mostly not on substance, but just on the more of the same fatigue that people have. You know, right. I, I think, and and that's my hunch more than it is, you know, it, that there's evidence that I'm right. But it, it is, you know, I think a, a well studied political hunch that people do get tired of this stuff at a certain point, and especially the people that you need to win back. Last thing I'll just mention to you guys, Jill Stein has announced that she will run for the presidency. She is uh, the Green Party nominee, two-time presidential nominee from the Green Party, and she will begin her run. The political system is broken, she says. The two Wall Street parties are bought and paid for. The Democrats have betrayed their have betrayed their promises for working people, youth, and the climate again and again, while Republicans don't even make such promises in the first place. So uh, workers just got a big victory uh, in in uh, the auto industry. Uh, I don't know how the, long. And, and in Hollywood, and, and you in know. Hollywood, and and you had a president who actually went and you know got with the UAW. I mean, Mark openly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean but they, they, I think progressives they would have to have a real candidate. Jill Jill Stein had her chance, and she messed it up in 2016. Democrats don't forget that. They know what problems she caused. It would have to be an Elizabeth Warren slash Bernie Sanders type candidate who found an issue that was really putting them at odds with Joe Biden before progressives had uh, someone somewhere to go. They're not going to go for Jill Stein. This Uh, is just real quick. I would say I'm I'm going to say is the favorite for the Green Party nomination. Uh, what, What did you say? Who is? Uh, Jill Stein. I Jill think Stein, you, yeah. have to, you have to call her the <laughs> okay. table. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, and finally, this Randy says, because I saw this is a high-profile thing Rick Santorum was saying, that the Ohio um, issue, the abortion law passing, uh, is a, a, a bad idea because pure democracies are bad and we shouldn't leave stuff like that up to the voters. Yeah, exactly. Of course not. You wouldn't want that left to the voters because they can actually tell you what they want, um, Rick Santorum. So... Every place that this abortion issue shows up as a referendum, it will be voted upon to protect a woman's right to her body. Don't you think, guys? I think so. And I think with the, one of the things that Democrats should be doing is put it in places where they can put more referenda on the ballot for 2024. And, and not only that, abortion, but also uh, for, um, for marijuana, get, that, get young people out. And I'm sure that there'll be another some kind of student loan situation that the Biden administration will give a shot at uh, just before to get the youth out. <clears throat> you know, they'll put together this coalition again and abortion will be the leading factor. But democracy is up there as well. You know, people aren't going to vote for Donald Trump because he's against democracy and he's going to get convicted before before the election. Yeah, uh, I feel like this guy. I must say, though, is it's like one of those, uh, you know, monster movies. The guy will, you know, he, he will continue to be a threat uh, from whatever situation, house arrest or whatever he finds himself in. But Jim and I will go around and around on that because Jim certainly thinks I'm wrong about that. And probably Michael does as well. Um, Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, always having you here. We'll look forward to a major announcement from Avila next week. Sure. Maybe I'll see you over at TYT later. Are you going to be over there today? I will not be. You won't see me. Oh. I'm I'm at Charlotte Airport right now, so I'm. Oh. Be... It almost seems like not worth going then if you're not going to be there. All right, I thought I Just might see you. you. The same. Okay. Yeah. Um, all, right. all right, guys. Thank you so much, Jim Avila, Michael Shore. Thank you, guys. Love it. Love it. Love it. The Mark Thompson Show. Yeah. Wherever you saw that referendum, you know that. Uh, People are voting directly on it, and you saw women vote in huge numbers. That's on, right. Yeah, and and as it as they should, you know. Jim Avila's got it right when he says women won't stand for that. Nope. Right.
but the system is set up so women have to stand for it in places that won't put it on the ballot. You know, that's the deal. So let's do some news. And uh, Michael Snyder, the culture blaster, will follow. Smash the like button if you would. Give me a thumbs up like Smash a boss. Smash it with your iron rod. Smash it with your iron rod. Hell yeah. Kim, ready with news? Yeah, I'm ready. I just had to ban somebody else. Oh. Uh-huh. You don't come in and in, in here and, and spread election fraud kind of stuff. Uh, oh. you, you don't don't lie about the election. President Biden won the election. If you come and you say all kinds of crap, then YouTube censors us for that. And so I can't I can't tolerate it. Sorry, you got to go. Oh yeah, that is true. If you have it in your feed, YouTube can take it down. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so there you go. Ch-ch-ch- She's tough. Kim's very very tough. Everybody, and you know. Sometimes that's the right person to have in charge. She's Where's the, the bouncer at this nightclub. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kim's news and uh, then the culture blaster will pass through. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. This report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee. Mm Mm-mm, good. House Republicans are issuing more subpoenas in their investigation into the Biden family's business dealings. Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer subpoenaed two former business associates of Hunter Biden, as well as Hunter's art dealer and an individual who purchased art from the president's son. The move comes after Comer subpoenaed Hunter, the president's brother, James Biden, and several other family members. Former President Trump's classified documents case still set to go to trial in May. The judge in the case today denied Trump's request to delay that trial until after the presidential election. She did leave open the possibility of pushing back the trial date at a later time and will consider the request when the parties meet in March. I don't know if you saw, Mark, that apparently Trump was incensed when he learned that his domestic help, the housekeepers at Mar-a-Lago, could be called to testify against him in this documents case because they say uh, made is the eyes and ears of the whole house. So that'll be interesting. Happy birthday, United States Marine Corps, 245th, 248th birthday today. The Corps was born in a Philadelphia tavern during the Revolutionary War in 1775. Those with the title of Marine celebrate November 10th as their own birthday. It is a yearly reminder of the brave spirit that has compelled young men and women to defend our nation and its interests for more than two centuries. Comes the day before Veterans Day. SAG-AFTRA's National Board will review a proposed labor deal today with the Alliance of Motion Pictures and Television Producers. If the board votes to approve the contract, it will be sent to union members for ratification. This deal, still considered tentative, ended the 118-day actor strike yesterday morning. The son of a prominent Hollywood TV producer is behind bars in connection with a headless torso found in a dumpster in California. The Los Angeles Police Department says 35-year-old Samuel Haskell Jr. is being charged with murder after evidence found at the crime scene led police to his house. That's where officers reportedly found blood evidence. Haskell is the son of Sam Haskell Sr., a well-known celebrity agent who's produced a number of Dolly Parton specials and Miss America pageants as well. Rap lyrics will be allowed into testimony in the Young Slime Life gang trial. That is set to begin later this month in Georgia. Rapper Young Thug and seven defendants are facing charges connected to violent crimes dating back to 2015. Yesterday, prosecutors argued before a judge that lyrics written by the rapper are indeed evidence of his crimes. Hmm. You can't do it and then sing a song about it without people realizing <laughs> that maybe you actually did it. Lord, I think we have mercy. a drop from a young thug from years ago. <laughs> Don't we have a young thug drop? Am I wrong do we about have that? that? Uh, what do we got? I think I've got, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only young thug is here. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the guy, right? That's right. Yeah, young thug is not here anymore, he's now uh, on trial for murder. You remember the movie The Blind Side? 
Of course. Yeah, the Tuies say they paid Michael Ower more than $138,000 of their proceeds from the book and the film, The Blind Side. The former NFL player claimed in court documents that Sean and Leanne Tuie never paid him a share, him his share from the profits. The Oscar winning movie detailed Ower's life story, filed a petition in August saying the couple said they were going to adopt him, but instead filed a conservatorship that kept him away from millions of dollars that were. That actually meant for him one hundred thirty eight thousand dollars to tell his life story and then made a, make a movie of it it doesn't seem like that's really a fair share i don't know it does but, seem as though there might be more to the share than just that mm, yeah uh, i mean the movie was huge right the movie uh, was hang on a really, second. Michael, really huge. My, michael michael snyder the culture blaster did you you want to weigh in on this yeah, yeah. <clears throat> i just want to say it's apparently, very unorthodox, apparently, right, apparently he was blindsided <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh Indeed. at that, Kim. How he dare was, you? He was. I like it. I like it. That oh, is a Michael classic Snyder's Schneiderism. Here. He will not let they. They couldn't let that get into the outfield on him. Let me yeah. immediately get to the fact that this report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee. Mm. It's a big to do at Coachella Valley Coffee. The holiday blend is almost upon us. Mark Thompson is going to test it and give us a full review of what's happening with the holiday blend on Monday. Yeah. But uh, and aren't we getting our own? Mark Thompson package of it? Isn't that I happening? hope so. I have to, I, I, I sent him a text and I have to get with him to work it yeah. out. So right now it's on the website, their holiday blend, and you will get 10% off with Mark T. But I'm trying to put together some kind of basket or gift thing or something for our mm -hmm. listeners. Cool. And I may even do a giveaway. Where I was going to say, uh, can we give yeah. a couple away? That'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to caucus with you and others. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we'll get that organized over the weekend and we'll maybe do it next week. CoachellaValleyCoffee.com is where you get it. And when you check out, do use that discount code Mark T, and they'll give you 10% off, off anything on the website. Teas, yes. they've got great teas there. It's Love a real tea. boutique, um, special place, Coachella Valley Coffee, and it's all yeah. the coffees hand-roasted. These are and, and sustainably grown. Just brilliant people. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. We're so late uh, today that I just want to get right into it. You know what I mean? I've, I, I can't. I can't wait. Um, I did. I didn't even tell my story yet. I had a big. I had a good story, Michael. Haven't had a chance to tell it. <sighs> Left a lot of lot of stuff in the green room, to be honest. You know. Um, yo, Mark. How is the poker game these days? Asked Gregory Deckelman. He asked with a super sticker for five bucks. First of all, thank you for the five. Or Big shout out. Uh, any return to a stream coming anytime soon? Uh, yeah, I during COVID, I didn't play poker at all. And then they invited me to a couple of games that were streamed online live. And I did play in those. I won in one. I think I lost in the other. Not important. Uh, definitely lost in one. I'm usually a, a good bet to lose, but um, then the uh, uh, then the COVID stuff has receded a bit, and I'm playing in a couple of home games, you know, just regular little games. But I'll keep you posted if I'm actually playing a game that streams somewhere. I will tell you, if you just of streaming. I'm on TYT today. Uh, in the second hour of the power panel. So if you're looking for a place uh, to get some, I think, some good takes on what's going on politically, TYT is a great place to go, and I'll be on the hour. The power uh, panel. Wow. Power panel. It's the Friday power panel. I know. I can see you on the power panel. Bring yeah, in the it's power. A, um, well, yeah. yeah it's, uh, I mean, I'm not. Do you know who I am? I'm just saying. I'm kind of a big deal. I bring the power. They bring the panel. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, all right. All um, right. I know, I know, Julie. You want the story, um, Michael. I can't, I can't, in good conscience, hold you up anymore to uh, tell the story. How do you feel about the story? Tonight? I could not care less about the story. But hey, <laughs> you know, that's because I can get it from you after hours. Well, that's not, I'm I'm gonna, Think about I'm, it as a programmer, though, as a producer. Oh, as a, as a producer, I, I would say maybe. go for the reviews. Go. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm going to. Uh, we'll gonna, put it off. I promise you, I will tell it on Tuesday when I come I'm, back. No, I'm going to make you record it so that I can roll it on Monday. Oh, okay, that's yeah. great. I will. Mm -hmm. do, I'll tell you what. That's what we'll do. Yeah. We'll record it, and then 
we will run it on Monday with Kim hosting the we'll show. We'll do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! She'll do it live and then I, I will record it. All right. Uh, without any further delay, uh, this guy knows movies, streaming, music. He comes and goes on a rainbow. How about it for the marvelous Michael Snyder, the culture blaster? Wow. Wow. Mark, I am so thrilled that you took time out of your busy schedule to host the show for a change, which is really heartening. How dare you? How dare you? No, Kim has been doing yeoman or your woman's work and, and, and you know, I'm she very is grateful. Pretty for terrific. Kim, Kim was fantastic yeah. last Friday, right. but it's good to have you back in the, uh, the captain's chair. Thank you. I, I have a topical riddle for you. Oh. Uh -huh. Where does Joe Montana live? Uh, doesn't he live in San Francisco? Joe's Mansion. Oh, it's uh, uh, because of mind. Joe Mansion. Why do yeah. I even bother? Yes, I'm very unhappy with everything <laughs> I've heard today. <laughs> yes, on your that's show. two two of us. Right? I uh, I travel back and forth between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and I got to say, the Santa Ana winds are blowing through the Southland. Yeah, uh, it's hard to believe that the hot air from uh, the other night's Republican debate in Miami could travel that far, oh, that fast. Oh, I see what you did. It nice a, job. Hey, I, it it blew. Anyway, um, <laughs> we should definitely get down to uh, moving. Movies, uh, new movies that are available for your delectation. Yeah, sure. Uh, delectation is a ding word. I, and I, uh, Dora, I thank you for uh, for uh, uh, grabbing some coffee from Coachella Valley Coffee. Oh, I have to also point out because you know we are very grateful for their support. I am enjoying the French press of yeah. uh, Coachella Valley Coffee, yeah. and it is as with the espressos. Oh. See si magnifique. Yeah, we're so, serving that today in the green room. Good for so you. So delicious. And yeah. uh, with that uh, blatant ad out of the way, uh, despite its collective title, The Marvels, the latest installment in the expansive transmedia world of the Marvel Cinematic Universe based on Marvel Comics and their heroes, is the de facto sequel to the 2019 box office uh, uh, smash Captain Marvel, which was a 90s period movie that starred Brie Larson as Carol Danvers, a fighter pilot imbued with otherworldly power. Imbued. Who is caught in the middle of an interstellar conflict between two alien races, the warlike Kree and the shape-shifting scrolls, the former having given Carol those super abilities. Uh, anyway, Samuel L. Jackson co-starred as a younger version of a longtime Marvel character uh, and S.H.I.E.L.D. super agent Nick Fury, and both Larson and Jackson are on board in The Marvels, which is a contemporary continuation of the MCU's grand multi-movie uh, movie and TV show narrative. Uh, to be honest, things have started to become a little uneven in Marvel's relentless output. Uh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was a banger of a movie and also quite moving. Mm -hmm. Eternals, on the other hand, was a slog. On the TV front, the second season of Loki with Tom Hiddleston just wrapped up, uh, him playing the god of mischief in a time-traveling epic that teamed him with a terrific cast, including Owen Wilson and Ki Hui Kwan, and it was immensely satisfying and very, very clever. Other MCU shows like Secret Invasion have not been so on point, but the track record in general is pretty good. It is a money machine for Disney and for Marvel, and even though there have been films and series that have worked independent of the greater Marvel saga, all of it benefits from having seen or understood you know, the, the, the context. Uh, if you know the backstories and characters, there's a better chance that you'll be happy with something like The Marvels, which teams Larson's Carol, Captain Marvel Danvers, with Iman Vellani's Pakistani-American teen heroine Kamala Khan, a.k.a. Ms. Marvel, and Tiona Paris's astronaut Monica Rambeau, all of whom wield light or cosmic energy in their battles against evil. So The Marvels is a three-hander that focuses on the relationship between this trio of super gals, and the initial hook is that when any of the three use their powers at the same time, they instantly switch places. Wow, it's, that's kind of wild. It's it's played for laughs and frequently funny and very um, kinetic, as I like to say. And then they discover that a Cree warrior uh, played by UK actress Zoe Ashton has a bone to pick with Captain Marvel. And then things get sort of darker. And meanwhile, Jackson's Nick Fury running a uh, new secret agency from a space station above the Earth uh, and serving as Monica's boss is trying to coordinate a defense against the uh, Kree threat. And this is designed to be fun for the fans. So I count myself among them. 
enjoyed what I watched. Uh, it offers some genuine treats with crazy teleporting fights. Uh, the fight sequences where they're teleporting back and forth, just, just absolutely wild. Uh, and um, there are cool Easter eggs. You stay till the end, fans. Uh, plus great interplay between the three women at the heart of the story, all nicely orchestrated by director Nia DaCosta, who uh, did the revival of Candyman, which I thought was absolutely terrific. And uh, she was also one of the four screenwriters, which is where the issues come into play. The villainous is lackluster, to say the least. She has murky motivations and goals, and the setup is kind of jumbled, all of which makes the Marvels less marvelous than it might have been. Uh, but there's a joyous component to Villani's performance as Kamala and her down-to-earth Jersey City family are a, they're a hoot amid all this, you got these space shenanigans, and then you've got this like, what's going on family, which is really kind of cool. And another source of laughs is Carol's pet Goose, who looks like a tabby cat, you'll like that, Mark, mm -hmm. but is in startling fashion much more than he seems. But the japery and the unexpected switcheroos that are a very entertaining part of the action undermine the emotional stakes that are built into the story. Uh, for instance, uh, Monica is the, the adopted niece of Captain Marvel. So uh, they've been separated. There's all that kind of, you know, human interest stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that that stuff, the emotional stuff gets a bit flattened or shortchanged. All in all, I can recommend the Marvels for the um, MCU faithful who will find enough to pleasure them, even if it's not among the studio's best. Hey, fun is fun, Mark. Champagne Wishes says, movie will flop, Michael. Fans don't like Brie. Ooh, and Brie is so good in Lessons in Chemistry on Apple TV right now. Brie is talented. She is the least of the three in this movie in terms of emotional uh, impact. And, and I don't know that the movie's going to bomb. There are things to be said about it, but all the prognosticators can, you know, hmm. say what they like at this juncture. All right. She worked, she worked for you in the movie is what you're saying. Uh, she worked for me in the context of the film. And again, the chemistry between the three female leads... Very good. Sounds uh, like you really need to know the it, it, backstory, the culture, the right. universe of this to make it further enhanced. Good... And so you can't go in cold. You can see something like Black Panther after you know having not seen any of the rest. You can see the three Guardians of the Galaxy movies and enjoy them for what they are, kind of standalones. Right. In this case, you got to be invested in the characters to an extent. So if you if you decided, all right, you know what, I'm going to take the college class to go see the Marvels. <laughs> what do I need to see? Um, it, it would help. Oh boy, I'm so sorry about this. It would help to see Captain Marvel. <laughs> right. It would help to see the a mini series, uh, <laughs> oh Wanda Vision, because that's where Tiana oh, yeah. Paris's character right. gets her gets her you know juice and mm -hmm. Ms. Marvel. I, I think that would be sufficient. Okay, so but you know what, Mark? Don't. I'm begging you. No, just, no, I'm not going to. I, I just asked. So. How go dare ahead. you even suggest? All right, go ahead. Uh, when David Fincher directs a movie, I want to see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, his filmography rocks. Are you ready? Zodiac, Seven, The Social Network, Mank, Gone Girl, Fight Club. I mean, is that enough to make my case? I would yeah, think so. Yeah, he's the real thing. He is. So, so what has he directed now? His latest feature film, The Killer, is here, and mm. it's very much in his wheelhouse. It, it doesn't reach the heights of those aforementioned uh, Fincher movies. Aforementioned. Yet it does work as a solid and sometimes snarky revenge thriller. Yeah, you, got, you had me at revenge, you know. Um, <laughs> the Killer traces a globe-hopping quest by a professional assassin trying to free himself from reprisals exacted by his employers and their henchmen and henchwomen after he botches a significant assignment. So Fincher had the good sense to tap Michael Fassbender to play the killer of the title, and Fassbender's ability to embody the cool and the cruel while implying a certain moral fiber or personal code of honor serves him well here. Uh, Tilda Swinton plays a peer of his. Arliss Howard uh, plays a client. Both are quite good in small but significant roles, and the visuals of the killer are expectedly stylish, as one would hope from a Fincher project. As an inside look at a hired gun and his dangerous world, the killer doesn't break much new ground, but Fincher is such a masterful director, and Fassbender, who narrates some of the movie in kind of a matter-of-fact way, is so compelling, even when playing you know, tightly wound, that it's hard to turn away from the screen 
And though it's not easy to empathize with an assassin, or more particularly this assassin, it's not hard to get wrapped up in his journey to want to see if he can beat all the forces aligned against him. Okay, I'm not going to call the killer with its deliberate pacing a thinking man's John Wick, uh, since the central figure here is not as seemingly indestructible as Keanu Reeves' uh, manic murder machine. Uh, the kill count isn't anywhere close to monumental in that regard. And the action comes in fits and starts rather than being nonstop carnage. There's also nothing particularly deep about this. It's just business as usual for a man whose job is taking out select targets with calculated precision uh, in a dispassionate manner, even when he's a target himself. On that level, the killer works, and it worked well for me. Wow. You like the killer. It's in theaters, and it's on Netflix. Uh -huh. So you can sit down tonight and uh yeah and get messed up and watch it i think that that's a plan stan all right all right as much as i appreciated aspects of both previous movies i reviewed i absolutely loved the darkly comic and thoughtful dream scenario which happens to be the latest showcase for Nicholas Cage's talents in a remarkable recent run that has included he is working a lot the taut noir flick uh, sympathy for the devil the over-the-top horror comedy Renfield the Western which we just talked about Butcher's Crossing and more and what's more dream scenario offers one of his finest performances Wow. Um, here he's college professor Paul Matthews, whose career and marriage are in a rut until, get ready, millions of people begin seeing him in their dreams, turning him into a celebrity. <laughs> okay, at first his uh, nocturnal appearances are fairly benign or nondescript. When news of the Nocturnal. phenomenon, uh, yeah. when news of the phenomenon starts to go viral online, Paul is approached by a marketing agency, and he's inspired to try and leverage the fame as a means to get a publishing deal for a scholarly book that he has yet to even write, or to profit off his unexpected notoriety. But as his public profile grows, his presence in people's dreams begins to change, and not for the better complications ensue. Uh, his wife, Janet, well played by Julianne Nicholson, with a hint of uh, the middle-aged Shirley MacLaine, is increasingly disturbed by the situation and put off by her husband's reaction to this uh, strange turn of events and his newfound renown. Their two daughters are thrown as well. W watching Cage as Paul attempt to navigate these bizarre, uncharted waters is an absolute delight. Uh, he goes from schlub to media star to victim. Uh, Screenwriter-director Christopher Borgley has given Cage a plum of a part with a script that kind of snaps and, and a smartly embedded uh, subtext about uh, our culture and society uh, that's less than flattering and uh, sadly truer than one would hope. And additionally, the supporting cast features Michael Sarah, Tim Meadows, and Dylan Baker. Wow. All delivering memorable performances. Dream Scenario, which was co-produced by that king of elevated horror, that Duke of Dread filmmaker Ari Aster, is like The Holdovers, which I gushed about a couple weeks ago. Yes. One of my favorite movies of the year and one that should get plenty of attention uh, as awards season ramps up, expect well-deserved acting honors for Cage. He's earned them here for what we might call a dream role. Um, uh, I get it. I know you do. Dream Scenario is in select theaters in Los Angeles and New York City. I'm told taught will be a ding word for us today. Very really? good talk. I don't know. I anyway, think. it's going to expand wider over the next few weeks. Be on the lookout for Dream Scenario. Dream Scenario. Yes, sir. Do you say scenario or do you say scenario? I say both of them depending on my mood. All right, go ahead, Kim. It, we, we will only have Kim for a few more minutes, so please continue, Michael. Uh, I do want to briefly mention It's a Wonderful Knife. Okay, so It's a Wonderful Knife is, in fact, a Christmas-themed horror movie. No. Uh, and someone said, well, wouldn't this be clever to have a movie named It's a Wonderful Knife where a serial killer goes bonkers at Christmas, and so they made it. And, of course, there are references to the famous uh, Jimmy Stewart, yeah. Frank Capra movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, mm -hmm. um, a young woman uh, stops a serial killer in the small town of Angel Falls, not to be confused with Bedford Falls, mm -hmm. and ends up, uh, because of her own life, kind of going down the drain in some ways, wishing that she had never been born. And when that happens, it turns out that the killings have continued and continued and oh. continued. And she's got to somehow stop them and get back to her 
um, or you know, because or, her being born was the thing that prevented all of these further deaths. Wow! And uh, threw her town into a quandary, to say the least. Um, <clears throat> it stars quandaries. It yes, it does. It stars yeah. uh, as the the uh, town leader of questionable virtue, Justin Long, as the father of our young woman who has a brother who disappears mm -hmm. uh, when she. Uh, decides she doesn't want to be born. Uh, the dad is played by Joel McHale. So we have a couple of talented actors there and a lot of uh, kind of unknowns. Uh, Cassandra Node playing the central figure, this girl. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, I would have to say, um, actually, the, uh, Winnie uh, is the central figure. Uh, she played by Jane Whittup. The other one is kind of uh, a sidekick. It doesn't matter. This is okay. Uh, you can... Uh, expect it's going to have some grisly moments. There's some knifings and violence and what have you. And I, I think it's more a concept in search of a movie. I see. Yeah, it's great, uh, great title. Oh uh, yeah. You say, but as you say, it might be just it might just play into the uh... cigarette smoking man from the X Files. Uh, William B. Davis is in this thing oh. in, in a character role. Uh, you know, it's uh, available on streaming December twenty second from Shutter which is the production company and also a streaming service geared to horror. And it's in theaters uh, in a limited way starting today. Uh, it's okay. Uh, directed uh, by Tyler McIntyre. Let uh, me it, review what you have uh, regaled us with here today, sir. Indeed, indeed. It's a wonderful knife is the movie you just heard about, the Christmas-themed horror movie that Michael says it's it's okay. Some good performances. It's okay, but he feels not, that it's not it great. A, you know, yeah. it, it, it's something you could watch when it comes out on Shutter. You know, dream scenario, and whether you say scenario or scenario, you will enjoy Nicolas Cage in this one, with some also brilliant performances from other contributors who you'll recognize. But dream scenario is the movie about the guy who becomes famous because he starts showing up in everybody's dreams. And Michael says there are even some questions about the modern culture that are that that arise through all of this. Yeah, viral hysteria is definitely taken down a peg. Dream scenario: the killer, the globe-trotting assassin, Michael Fassbender, is in this one. Michael didn't like this that much, no, actually. I liked it. I just oh, didn't think did? it was up to his. Okay. Up to Fincher's usual. You wanted more than you were getting. Yeah, it, it was it was it was good for what it was. Okay, I was I was constantly riveted by what was going on on screen, even when things were very deliberate uh, in terms of him doing the assassin's job and setting up his various um, victims, if you will. The Marvels. You say you need to know the world of MCU. Yeah, it, it's it's not at the pinnacle of them. It's not at the at the bottom of the barrel when it comes. What to What does MCU Marvel. stand for? Marvel Cinematic Universe, right. my friend. I'm just checking it out it, now. Yeah. Uh, so if you are up on the MCU, you'll enjoy the Marvels. If you're not, you can do one of two things: you can either get buff on the MCU world. Or blow the whole thing off. Yeah. So that's you know, the, um, take, take that, your pick. That, those and, are your choices. And it, it, it's fun. It's not great. It's not wor uh, world shattering, earth shaking, although, you know, obviously what happens on screen, yeah. you know. The, the but, but of the movies, the Marvels, the killer, dream scenario, and it's a wonderful knife, it sounds to me, Michael Snyder, Culture Blaster, as though you like dream scenario most. You are correct, All Mr. Right. Thompson. It, um, it was great. And that's in theaters, in limited release, but it will soon be out uh, in a bigger way. Wider release over uh, the next few weeks. Michael Snyder, it is a delight to see you. The Niners, give me 30 seconds on that, please. Jacksonville Jaguars uh, are considerably better than their recent history would suggest. And Trevor the Niners are considerably not uh, as great as their... Uh, they're coming back uh, with a, a Is Debo few... back or not? Debo will be back. He still may have that kind of hairline fracture in his shoulder. Trent Williams seems to want to play. He's been practicing. Um, Brock has to. Brock Purdy has to get his ducks in a row and and then hit them. With yeah, his, he says that. Uh, he says it's his fault. He was very uh, this week outspoken about and, the fact and that he's yet, like, it's let me my make fault. an interesting point. He is the second highest rated quarterback in the in, in, entire NFL. Even Comes after down to these... a couple of key moments. Yeah. I mean, and he, you know, getting that pass rush, they're going to have to, you know, find ways to protect him. Um, 
Love talking to you. Love that you stop by and look forward to your next visit. He comes and goes on a rainbow. Have a great weekend, everyone. Go Niners. Michael Snyder, everybody. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't get enough of it. Wow. Pretty, pretty cool. The Mark Thompson Show. Yeah. You know, let me, uh, this is kind of a new thing for me because, um, hold on. Because normally I have a producer here or Kim here to take the show off the air. Today I don't. I've never been here by myself. Those of you who've stuck around a little bit, many of you have gone over to the after party. You know, that's where Kim and John do their show. And Kim's already left for that. Um, You're already there, so I'm not talking to you right now. But I am talking to everybody else who is um, with us. And it's been a delight. Good week. Um, thanks to Kim for doing the show a lot, but I'm kind of in a situation now where I have to finish the show myself. And the first thing I notice is that your banner is still up there, Michael. How that's outrageous. We'll take that down. And now I'm uh, kind of, um, I'm charged with closing things out. I don't know that I can. I don't know that I want to. All right, let's figure this out now. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, it is uh, with the greatest reluctance that I, um, that I close things out. And I didn't realize that I would have to run credits, but I will run them. And um, we'll all meet back here on Monday, except it'll be Kim live. But we'll have a Mark's Murder Mystery Monday on Monday that we'll record for you over the weekend. And I'll have the story, which is legit wild. Uh, It involves my mother, and I don't want to say much more than that, and her car. That's all I'll say. Um, Smash the like button. Share this. If there's any part of the show, maybe it was the political stuff from Michael and Jim. Maybe it's other stuff. Maybe it's Florida. You can share that as we drop those videos later today. We'll drop them, and you can share them across social media. Share our shorts. If you're on Facebook or whatever, it's a great way to support the show. So you can, um, you know, it's weird to be in this place. I mean, where you, you have to ask for support, but that's what we have to do. I mean, the, uh, the audience is important and you sharing our show is important to growing the audience. So really appreciate you all being here and sharing the show, as I say. Next week, apart from Monday, we are here all week. And we're looking very much forward to you joining us. There's also a major announcement coming next week. And over the weekend, I'm going to work out some giveaways on the holiday coffee from Coachella Valley Coffee. So there's a lot to look forward to next week and some great guests on tap next week as well. Looking forward to seeing you all here. I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. I'll see you over at the After Party Live, everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.